Cool. So we are getting set up here again. We're double digit attendees. I know some of you, some, some new faces, um, some new names anyway, which is awesome. Uh, there's some sort of vibrating sound. Not sure if it's my speakers or from yours. Uh, anybody else want to tune in and let us know if there's a, a vibrating sound of sorts. And what I'm going to do real quick is I'm going to introduce Dan. Um, if you're on this, you probably already know, uh, some people in the in the public group are, are saying hi. Um, you probably already know I talk about Dan a lot. Uh, and, and what I do is I'm hopelessly curious. I like to learn new stuff. I don't like to be uh, inefficient in anything I do. I'm always challenging my own beliefs as well as uh, what I've been taught by others. And uh, Dan came into the network and we've had a lot of conversations. And every conversation we have, there's a new insight. There's a new perspective. There's a new tip or trick that just will help me get to my ideal life, the the quality of life that I want uh, faster. And that's also, I think, one of the things that Dan is going to talk about is when we talk about finances, we get really caught up in revenue and numbers and all this stuff. Um, really understanding how to generate and accelerate wealth, right? But wealth as you define it, what is wealth to you? Is it being retired? Is it traveling with your family? Is it having an empire? Is it having 14 businesses or is it having one business that funds all the other things you want to do? Um, and that's something that's missing, in my opinion, in this this whole uh, business development world. So, um, and I've, I've seen Dan speak and it's always concepts, principles, things that you can take and use and extrapolate out to all the areas of your life. Uh, and then always has these tidbits of immediately actionable information that, uh, it is one of the reasons why he's one of my most interviewed people is even though we talk all the time, every single time there's something new. So that's why he's here. He has nth degree CPAs, which was just named a top 10 most well-run firm in the country, which is pretty cool. That's not something that is, uh, that that's something to be, in my opinion, something to be proud of is like being recognized for the way that you run your company, not vanity numbers or reported revenues or whatever it may be. Uh, everybody says fine here, no vibrations, blah, blah, blah. Cool. So Dan, I'm going to let you roll. Um, I'm looking forward to, to this whole thing, this whole profit takeover, the financial takeover and uh, really shifting the way that people think about money and, and long-term wealth accumulation and acceleration. Cool. Great. Well, I've got some slides that I'll pull up in just a second, but if it's uh, so, if it's okay with everyone, I, I want to kind of add on to that that intro from Nick. So I guess when I talk about myself, which I, as Nick knows, I hate doing, but I usually like to tell folks if you can kind of imagine that cliche kid growing up scheming on business ideas, that was basically me as a kid. So uh, my my lucky parents were always trying to uh, to rein me in, and then I got a d degree in accounting and separately information systems. Uh, solely because I thought that that was kind of the broadest skill set to start a business, not at all thinking that I would start an accounting firm. And then I went about as far away from entrepreneurship as, uh, as you can go, which is uh, to the accounting standards board. So got nominated for and accepted for a fellowship at the board that writes all the uh, accounting standards here in the U.S. And uh, spent, spent my time there helping write an accounting standard on derivatives and hedging activities, which... Uh, uh, most people have sort of a visceral cringe when I start talking about the details of that accounting standard. And uh, really awesome opportunity, but frankly, I was I was pretty miserable do, doing that. Uh, again, because I got an accounting degree because I thought I was going to be a uh, run a business. And uh, so I was having a little bit of a dif difficulty reconciling that. And uh, so I moved back to Seattle where I'm from and uh, started working at one of the big global accounting firms in what I thought was gonna be a consulting role. And uh, what it ended up being was I was just a West Coast derivatives expert. And uh, so it had a little bit of a quarter life crisis. I'm the first person in my family to go to college. So as you might imagine, my parents were sort of rooting me on quite a bit of like, this is awesome, you're doing a great job. And I'm sort of going like, well, this is not what I had designed for my, my life. Sorry if there's we strangely have some sun all of a sudden in Seattle that's like reflecting off my face. So <laughs> let me see if I can move around a little bit or maybe I'll have to do something about the, uh, the blinds here in a second. But uh, so yeah, I had a little bit of a quarter life crisis and uh, 
Now it looks really strategic, but it wasn't. So moved around for, for a little bit, left uh, Deloitte, worked for a company that was uh, backed by Warren Buffett, getting ready to go public. And then I worked in strategic finance for a couple of years for the now CFO of Roku, and then a couple of years in tax. And so finally, about nine years ago, I realized, hey, I think I'm pretty good at this accounting finance thing, long story long. And that was the basis for starting my firm, Nth Degree CPAs. And what I realized was uh, the data is pretty clear. Uh, most people just uh, hate tax and accounting. And so that's sort of a, a good jumping off point to jump over to uh, jump over to some slides. So Nick, if you wouldn't mind uh, letting me know if you can actually uh, see the slides here in just a second. Um, yeah, they are. Yep. There, there they are. Okay. Slides. Yep. I'm doing it. So uh, there's 17 of us here. Just ask yourself, you know, uh, who here hates tax and accounting? Maybe just drop drop a comment uh, in the chat here. Do you, do you hate tax and accounting? Uh, who thinks taxes are fair? Uh, who makes business decisions based off things like net present value, future value, or weighted average comparisons? Uh, who here actually knows what that means? <laughs> what net present value, future value, weighted average comparison, what those things are. Now, let's... Uh, now, with that in mind, and now that I've got your anxiety stirred up a little bit, let's just let's just close our eyes for a moment, uh, take a deep breath. I can't actually see you guys, so uh, hopefully, hopefully you're doing that. Um, take take a deep breath. Now, here here is the real here is the reality. The reality is is that, like I said, the majority of you you hate tax and accounting. You're actively avoiding it. And uh, if I were to talk to you one on one you might say things like, I know I should be looking at my numbers. I know I should be preparing budgets, saving. Uh, I should be uh, planning my savings. I know I need to hire a bookkeeper or a tax advisor. And sort of the list just goes like on and on and on and on of all these things that you say uh, that you should be doing. And so really then why are we driving so hard towards seven or eight figures but we aren't actually handling our finances in a way that, that maximizes our, our wealth acceleration. Like, why are we not actually doing that? We know all these things that we quote unquote should be doing, but, but we aren't. And so with that in mind, um, where's the disconnect? Nick, I guess, any thoughts? Where's, where's the disconnect? And I'm gonna go close my blinds so I don't look like Casper this entire time. <laughs> I'll tell you that I, I was muted, so I talked for a second there, and nobody could hear me. Um, <clears throat> there, there's a disconnect. My, my, my guess is the disconnect is, one, it's tough, and two, um, the benefits are somewhere else in, like, future space and time, you know, and it's a little bit uh, – it's a little bit harder to understand, at least for me, that that's where I get caught up is when my behavior, my, my behavior doesn't match my espoused values is, uh, is the consequence is somewhere else in space and time. And it's not clear to me what that consequence is or isn't. Um, so it's kind of, yeah, I know, you know, it's kind of like me. Yeah, I know I should probably like same reason people don't quit smoking. Like I know I should, but I may or may not get lung cancer anyway. <laughs> and I, I don't really know. How to how to like what the lead indicators of that are? Yeah, yeah, and and back to the data. The reality is this topic is just it's stressful because to some degree it's the scoreboard, and you you spend all this time trying to define what success looks like, and part of that is this seven or eight figure thing, and then your your financials and all these forecasts and stuff to some degree are this this uh, scoreboard that maybe doesn't align with. Your, what you're uh, targeting or what you uh, intend to create. So let me give you a little bit of background here. So as I mentioned, uh, leading into my, into my uh, bio a little bit that I've, I've worked with, with uh, some startups, I've worked with billionaires, I've done all the sort of uh, Fortune 500 stuff, worked with Fortune 1, one companies. And this, there's a crazy thing that happens. There's an essential question that everyone is asking themselves. And quite literally, is it's am I going to be okay? Am I gonna really? Am I gonna run out of money? So, it's sort of this more money, more problems. So you could be at zero dollars in revenue, and you're worrying, are you gonna be okay? And you can be at a billion dollars, and you're still wondering, 
Am I going to run out of money? Is something, something bad going to happen that's going to blow things up? And so there's something called Parkinson's law that kind of explains all this. Uh, and on, on uh, one axis is effort and the other is, is time allowed. And basically what this represents is uh, as we basically, uh, if you're given two hours to do something, it's going to take you two hours. If you're given four hours, it's going to take four hours. If you're given eight hours, it's going to take eight hours. You probably know this is true if, if you have employees and you tell them, get this done in two hours. It takes them that amount of time, no matter how much they have on their plate, their perception is that they're, that they're busy. I think back to uh, my life before kids. And I remember feeling like really, really busy. And now I have kids and I'm like, hey, what did I do with all my time before I had kids? Like I had so much more time. And the reality was Parkinson's law, I was filling it up with, with, uh, with other things. And so the same thing is true with, with money. As we make more money, as we have more income, our expenses elevate and they eat up all of that, that profit. <laughs> and I, I often think about one of my favorite places to go is to, is to Hawaii, to Maui specifically. And I think about this anecdote that someone uh, said to me once. And the first day you go to Maui or Hawaii or pick whatever your favorite destination is. And, and you, uh, you go out that night and you, and you look you look out at this beautiful sunset and you're like, oh, this is amazing. I feel so relaxed. This is like, I'm in heaven. This is so peaceful. And then the next day you go, you know what would make this better is some sort of fruity drink. So then you go out to the sunset the next day and you're like, okay, I got the sunset. I got the fruity drink. Now everything is perfect. And then the next day you're like, you know what would make this better is if I had a cigar. And so now you've got the sunset, you got the fruity drink and the cigar. And then the next day, and you get the point at this point, you just keep adding more and more. Uh, whereas before some simple thing, just looking at the sunset was sort of perfect. Now, all of a sudden you've had to layer, you've layered in all these additional things. And that's really what happens as we make more money. We just, we just keep increasing our expenses. And so you may have gone from, uh, being low six figures to now seven figure business and you're still going, hey, where, where is all the money? Uh, and so with that, I wanna talk a little bit about the, the neuroscience behind all of this and why this happens. Because honestly, this is the stuff that is actually critical to rigging the game to win, to making the right financial decisions, to having the right framework in place. We can talk about tax hacks and all that sort of stuff. Uh, the two Oreo principle, I got a million of those sort of things. But at the end of the day, we got to rig the game to win. We need to set up the systems and processes to get uh, the outcomes that we want under all potential scenarios. And so it starts with, with sort of the neuroscience behind how we make these decisions. So there's this equation that says anxiety equals uncertainty times powerlessness. And this is from, uh, I wish I, I came up with this equation. It's from a guy named Chip Conley. And what I find particularly interesting, and this certainly uh, reigns true to me and I don't know, drop, drop a comment here in the chat if, if this feels true to you as well, but this idea that the sense of lack of power really amplifies the uncertainty. So it's intentionally not an addition. It's not anxiety equals uncertainty plus powerlessness. It's times because the more lack, the, the greater your sense of uh, lack of power that you have, uh, the more anxiety that, that you have. They amplify each other. Uh, and so we can just drop in financial here and say, well, Really what we're saying is that financial anxiety equals financial uncertainty times financial powerlessness. So ultimately, if we wanna minimize our financial anxiety, then we need to reduce our financial uncertainty and our financial powerlessness. So how do we, how do we actually go about doing that? Because here's the reality, we can never get uncertainty to zero. It's impossible. There's too many external factors. There's what's going on in the economy, what our competitors are doing, what our employees are doing. Oh, the Facebook algorithm changed today. Oh crap, you know, I, this, my sales pipeline's all screwed up. There's things that are outside of our control. So we can never get uncertainty to zero, but certainly we wanna get as close as possible. But ultimately power, that's something that, that we have the most amount of control over. We have the, the, the freedom to make our choices and set up the systems that, that we want. So, you know, the usual solution that I see constantly is a combination of, well, you just got to get your mindset right. You know what your problem is with money is that your mindset sucks. You, know, you just got to get that right. And, or you know what, you're just lacking 
the right metrics. So early on, I was talking about if I were to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation, which I've had thousands of at this point, you would say things like, I should have a budget, I should have a bookkeeper, I should be looking at metrics, I should know my numbers, all these should statements. Uh, should, in general, as an anxiety creator, it's one of the 10 cognitive uh, distortions. Uh, it doesn't help you, but we all do this sort of, I should, I should have, I should have. Uh, and so there's a lot of shaming that I see out there around, around mindset and this idea that you should be having all these metrics. But here's the fundamental problem in all this is that uh, Daniel Kahneman, he's famous, uh, I think he's won, a, won at least one Nobel Peace Prize, uh, wrote this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. And what he established is that you can really break your, your brain into two systems, system one and system two. And system one is our fast thinking uh, part of our brain. It, it's what allows us to, frankly, make it through the day. We make thousands and thousands of decisions that just happen to occur in nanoseconds. You know, should I raise, move my hands around right now? How should I project my voice in this situation? Um, crossing the street, how do I look out for cars? All, all these sort of things that, that are necessary for us to sort of exist in the world. And then system two is really our conscious brain, our deliberative thinking. It's solving math problems. It's putting together slide decks. It's thinking about copywriting. It's just that sort of uh, laborsome process that we go through. And so the, here's the challenge though. System one, the sort of autopilot system that allows us to exist, that system is subject to biases. And it has to, in order to make decisions in nanoseconds, it's gotta be sort of pre-framed to make all these really quick decisions. And it can't be turned off. If you just shut off system one, you, you no longer can exist in the, in the world. Uh, whereas system two, that's where all that mindset stuff is helpful. And I'm not someone who's poo-pooing on doing mindset work. I've done counseling therapy for the last 12 years and have had multiple therapists and coaches and counselors and all that stuff uh, because it is important, but we're subject to biases that can't be turned off. And so uh, let's, let's talk about a scenario here. So uh, imagine you've got this $20 bill and you take the $20 bill and you go to the movies and you purchase a $10 ticket and you get $10 back. So you get to the ticket taker and you can't find your ticket. So what do you do? Do you go home or do you buy a new ticket with your remaining 10 bucks? Drop a, drop a comment real quick. What do you do here? So in this scenario, are you gonna, are you gonna buy a new ticket with the remaining 10 bucks or are you gonna go home? Uh, <clears throat> I would, uh, if, if you're watching here, I would implore you to go through this. Um, super, super useful to, to participate here. Uh, Josh says buy a new one. Katie says buy a new one. Josh. Everybody says buy a new one in, the, in this chat. Okay. Everyone, everyone says buy a new one. Great. Okay. So uh, that's sort of what I expected because we got a group of entrepreneurs here. But let's say that you've got the, the let's change the scenario slightly. You got the $20 bill, you take the $20 bill and you get change for two tenths. And then you go purchase the, the ticket. Um, but when you go to purchase the ticket, you can't find that, can't find one of your $10 bills. What do you do? Do you go home or do you buy a new ticket with remaining 10 bucks? So slight change here. Scenario one, we bought the ticket, we lose it. Scenario two, we got change first. And then we find that we've lost one of the $10 bills. So what do you do? Now, because everyone said in this group that they, under the first scenario, that they would go and buy the ticket. Uh, under the original scenario, I'm assuming you would all say the same. Let me know in the comments, if not. Now, what's crazy about this is that uh, this was an actual study. I didn't make this up. Uh, done by a couple of Yale behavioral economists. And under scenario one, believe it or not, only 46% of, of uh, the people in the study bought a, the ticket. And just by incrementally shifting the scenario slightly where the money was uh, bucketed into two $10 bills, it moved from 46% to 88% who would buy. Nick, why do, you, why do you think that is? This is specifically called the mental accounting bias. Well, <laughs> I, I have an advantage is that we've been through this before, um, but it's, it's the... Uh, it's the bucketing, right? The, the mental bucketing. Uh, bucketing. That's right. So our brains, they're just, they just naturally keep things separately.
but our intuition to keep things separately causes us to violate some basic economic principles. The idea that, that this term fungible, that money is fungible, that a, a $10 ticket is the same as a $10 bill. And so in the process of, of sort of making decisions, uh, we all think that we are uh, rational, logical, that, that we've got a process. Some of us are really educated. We've studied uh, economics. We've studied finance. Oh, uh, we're entrepreneurs. We're always working on being the best version of ourselves. So we're going to make the right decision, right? All the entrepreneurs here said under the first scenario, uh, they would under scenario one, they would go and, and rebuy the ticket, probably because of opportunity cost. I already drove to the theater. I set aside time. It's $10. I don't want to go home. I'm going to buy it. But the reality is, is that most would not. And uh, this is just a study to illustrate that we have problems in our mind uh, bucketing money appropriately. And so, uh, and the question is like, okay, well, cool. Now that I know about this mental accounting bias, that the way that I bucket money is going to impact decision-making, I'm not going to violate any sort of economic principles, right? I'm good. Well, wrong. Uh, the problem is, is that there's something else called the GI Joe bias. And that bias says that even if you know about the mental accounting bias or some of the other biases like uh, pricing bias, anchoring bias, so on and so forth, uh, even if you know that these biases exist, you're still subject to them. And even if you know about the GI Joe bi bias, or even though you know that knowing about biases, that means you're still subject to them, you're still subject to them anyways. So there's actually no way to sort of get yourself out of these uh, biases because we've got this system one thing that's operating that allows us to make these quick quick decisions. So I told you all of that so that we can get into the meat of things. Uh, how do we actually rig the game to win? Uh, and the reality is, is the solution is something that I've created called the profit priority. It's sort of the next evolution of some things that you've probably already seen out there in the marketplace. Uh, things like profit first, uh, a lot of things that say Dave Ramsey puts out there. Uh, the reason why that stuff works is is back to the mental accounting bias. So simply by setting up buckets allows you to make better decisions, allows you to understand uh, better uh, what available funds you have to, to make decisions. And so the process, and I'll just take you through this. Step one is we need to understand our, our positioning. Where, where are we at? What do we need? Uh, step two is our priorities. Uh, what do you want and, and why do you want it? And, uh, and I guess, how soon do you want to have it? And then, then you get into the optimization. What are you making? Uh, what are you spending? And then there's an ongoing calibration process that's necessary. And back to these biases, you can't just jump to the optimization and calibration phase. There's too many biases that are going to impact your ability to sort of see the, uh, uh, see the whole playing field. And so intentionally starting with positioning and then priorities is key to really getting the outcomes that you want. So, so let's talk about position. And I'm a big advocate of what I call dynamic adaptable financial models. These are the tools that we really should be using to make uh, the decisions for our business. There are a whole host of sort of should statements. Now, Nick, maybe if you can, you can uh, mute your, your side of things for a second so we can talk about this. So what are some of the most common questions that you get asked on a day-to-day -day basis? The, the most common, um, especially when it comes to, to money, is I would say, one, what do I do with my money? Uh, and two, employee, um, 1099, W-2, how do I pay employees is a really big one. Um, and then there's, there's a very, there's a, there's a question that, um, I don't know if it comes from the, uh, a cookie cutter, like a profit first thing, but it's, it's, Hey, what percentage should go to X, Y, Z? What percentage of my revenue should go to marketing? Uh, yeah. that's generally what people are looking for when, when they, when they come to us with those questions. And the challenge with all those questions fundamentally are that, that, uh, they are preferences. Right. Should I grow my business? Should I not? Back to these should state uh, framework. But uh, I want. I think I want to invest in a marketing program. I think I want to launch a new product. What should I? What should I do? I, should I give somebody a raise? Should I not? And the problem is, is that you could ask those questions to 
uh, several different people and get several different answers. And the reason for that is that they are preferences. There's not necessarily a right or wrong, but we're wired to look at things in a fact or fiction framework. And if it's fact or fiction, you just, you can go Google that. Okay. You know, what, why is the sky blue? Uh, you can go Google that and get some facts on why that's the case, but you can't necessarily go and Google preference-based questions. So we've got to build a different toolkit to be able to answer that. So one of the things that I do around positioning is that is this idea of core capital, okay? The whole concept of these reserves and what I have on the screen is around this notion of core capital. Our business needs core capital, our personal finances, uh, we need core capital. In the personal finance framework, core capital is simply the amount of money that you need to, to retire. And uh, that's the amount of money that you want to have well diversified. In the business context, core capital is what is the amount of money I need to be able to make ongoing decisions without being too overly leveraged. So under the, on the personal core capital side of things, there's a pretty basic equation that you can use where there's a really complex approach. Uh, but the basic approach is to go how much it's called the rule four. we don't want to take more than four percent out of our finances uh, or out of our retirement in any given year with the idea being that our finances will go up by four percent so if we take out four and it goes up by four we're we're in a good place it nets out and so four times 25 is 100 and so we can figure out roughly how much do we think we want to spend each year and that times 25 is how much we need in core capital Plus or my, plus any sort of additional one-time expenses. So if you go in general, I'm going to spend 100 grand when I retire. That times 25 is 2.5 million. And then you go, okay, I want to pay for my kids' college. I want to pay for a second retirement home. What are the values of that? Add that in. That's your that's your core capital number. So you can. Use, so then the second side is this sort of business core capital. And <laughs> excuse me, what I like to do is have three different reserves. I've just got some examples up here. So one is a sal salary reserve. And that's basically how much money do I need to keep in my business to pay myself, the lowest amount that I, I need to get by, and to pay any employees. So in this example, I said three months. But depending on how much of a reserve, how much of a recurring revenue business you have, you may want to have more or less. So if you're a really high recurring revenue business, you've got people on long-term contracts, you can maybe ratchet that number down a little bit. Uh, if you don't have recurring or retainer clients, you probably want to hold on to a little bit more. So uh, taking your, your average amount of monthly salaries, in this case, times three, that's how much we need. Uh, how much have we currently funded? What's the difference? And then we look at operating expenses. And in this framework, that's basically all of our other expenses. And we say, let's have two months set aside there. Now, there's a reason why we're bucketing this different or in, we're separating this out. Why? Mental accounting bias. The risk characteristics of salary are frankly, they're just different than the rest of our bills. Because at the end of the day, you gotta, you gotta get paid and your employees have to get paid. And you, it's a pretty substantial investment to bring people onto your team. And so you don't wanna just simply let them go whenever something goes sideways. Whereas all your other expenses, marketing, software as a service, usually you can get out of those faster or without a whole lot of friction. So they have different risk characteristics. And then the last bucket is an investment bucket. And I use a sliding scale based off profits. <laughs> and so, for example, I might say of my first 100,000 in profits, I'm gonna put aside 10 grand, 10%. Under my next 100,000, I'm gonna put aside 20%, so on and so forth. And so what I'm doing here with these reserves is that I'm intentionally bucketing them based off different risk characteristics and that, they're dynamic in the sense that I've written the rules. So when salaries go up, my reserve needs to go up. When salaries go down, the reserve goes down. Same with operating expenses. So how you actually use this practically speaking is in making some of these preference-based decisions where now we've created a little bit more of a fact fiction framework where Nick says, Dan, I wanna hire somebody. Okay, how much, do they, how much is their annual salary? 90 grand. Okay. How much do you have in your reserve right now? It's fully funded. Okay. You, you like to set aside uh, four months worth of reserve. So one third. So uh, one third of their salary 
is uh, 30 grand. How long would it take you to get that much in reserve set aside? And then the answer from there, okay, it would take me four months. All right, is it worth it to you to increase the reserve uh, over the next four months to get it to that target, yes or no? And then you have a little bit more of a framework to make a decision, a measuring stick against uh, how to make that type of decision. Same with operating expenses. Should I make, should I add this, this monthly expense? Well, how much do you have in your reserve? And so it allows you to compare. Now you may go, you know what, I'm going to add this person and I don't feel like I need to increase my reserve because I already feel like I've padded it quite a bit. Okay, that's fine. But you've separated it into buckets. Most people are just looking at one overall bucket and they go and they're making decisions purely based off what online banking says today. When I woke up in the morning, online banking says I've got 50 grand right now. So can I afford, afford to hire this person? You know, yes or no. Not necessarily thinking about all the future expenses or the checks that clients have in cash, all that sort of stuff. The reason why we use a sliding scale based off profits for our investments are because investments are bets, in my opinion. So anytime I'm doing something new, it's a bet. And we all know that, that uh, intuitively, that or at least folks say a lot online that they fail more than they're successful. And so there's that narrative, but at the same, so if that's the case, that's sort of like the house usually wins, which is kind of like betting. <clears throat> so we're making all these bets. And if we're, gonna, if we're actually going to the casino, unless we've got some sort of gambling problem, when we go to the casino, usually we go, okay, I'm, this, I'm going to have fun and I'm prepared to lose 500 bucks. You know, if I win, awesome. But ultimately I know that the house usually wins. So I'm willing to lose 500 bucks. I'm just making up arbitrary numbers. Well, the same is true. If you're trying to rig the game to win in your business, then you need to separate out from your profits an amount that you can play with that if it happens to go to zero, you're fine with. In other words, it doesn't create a leverage situation where it has to pay off now because we're trying to play the long game, right? And so oftentimes what I see folks doing is they invest in a marketing campaign, they invest in a new hire, pick whatever investment you want, a new line of business. They need it to pay off tomorrow or by the end of the month, two months. You can't play the long game. And the reality is, is that more times than not, it's likely to not work out. And so we want a pile of money that we're okay if it goes to, if it goes to zero. Now, that doesn't mean we're not going to do the damnness to make sure it doesn't, but ultimately we're okay with it going to zero. <laughs> and it's got to be separated. It's back to the mental accounting bias. If we lump it all together, we're going to make the wrong decisions. Nick, anything you want to, you want to add on to that? No, I, you might touch, you might touch on it. Something we talk about all the time, but just the concept of uh, like creating rules like that uh, yeah. because the bank, the online banking might say, yes, I can afford this. But when it's weighed against, if you want to retire your wife in the next 10 years, right, then you must do this before you must do X, Y, Z before you do ABC. And hundred percent. Yeah. I see what business owner, that's actually the next slide. So what I see business owners doing is, we're constantly focused on uh, trying to get to whatever the next goal is, seven figures, eight figures, nine figures, so on and so forth. And we keep in making these investments that have to be paid off. And then there's, there's never any cash flow to actually fund our priorities, which is, the, which is the next slide. So here's a pretty common set of examples, example priorities that I get from my clients. Reduce workload by 10 hours per week, fund retirement, purchase a second home, retire a spouse, pay for your daughter's college. Uh, each one of these have a dollar value to them. So what we can do, uh, and let me use the, uh, the drawing tool here. Um, As you pull that up, I'm just going to tell everybody that this is everything that we do, like the in this group and in my audience, this is what ultimately I'm trying to to give insight perspective on is like actually reaching the life that you want, like achieving the things that are going to make you happy. Uh, and, and you've just done such a great job, Dan, of, of uh, building a framework and like calling it profit priorities, which makes a whole lot of sense. 
Yeah, thank you, Nick. And so what we do is we start, we got we take those priorities from the previous page. My drawing skills are not very great, uh, as you can tell, but we take those, those priorities from the previous page and we go, how much are, are we required to have? Okay, so to work 10 hours less per week, maybe that costs 250 grand. I need to hire a couple of people. Uh, I want to have a housekeeper come by. I want a gardening service. It could be any number of things. So I need 250 grand. These are made up numbers, um, but often too not, not too far from the truth. And I've got 23 grand set aside currently. And then, okay, fund retirement. And this is based off the core capital figure where we go 25 times what our spending is plus any one-time purchases. How much have we set aside? And so you can just line all this out, dollar value. And then what we wanna do is come back up here and go, how much profit do we have currently? And how much, this is the key, how much are, have we already allocated to existing expenses? In other words, how much do we actually have left over without changing anything? And oftentimes it's almost nothing uh, that's left over. In this example, 20 grand. Why? Parkinson's law. As we started making more and more money, we just kept increasing our expenses. When I first started in degree, like I can live on 60 grand. Now I've got two kids, a, a puppy, uh, you know, private school for my oldest daughter, someday private school for my youngest daughter. These are, that was on my profit priority list, right? You just go through the list of things and all of a sudden, you know, what used to be 60 grand is now a much, much greater number. And so we got to look at the funds remaining. So this is a crazy thing that, that uh, exists uh, more often than not, which is that we line out all the priorities, we look at how much is remaining, and then we go, how long is it gonna take us to fully fund? And it's something like 400 years. In other words, not in your lifetime based off the current behaviors. And that can be pretty overwhelming and, and Folks don't usually do this exercise on their own. I've given out this worksheet to folks. They don't do it because it's scary because you're defining success and you're also defining failure at the same point. And intuitively, you know that the number right now based off your spending habits isn't gonna work. It's some crazy number like 400 years. So what do we do with that? Do we just give up? Obviously, no. What we do with it is we figure out before we try to simply grow our business, we figure out where's the extra cash. So we need to look at how can we go about maximizing our assets, reducing our liabilities, changing the cost structure of our business, optimizing tax, uh, reducing operational inefficiencies, having better reporting. And so from that, oh, from that, how much additional cash do we actually have left? And then how much uh, from there? So oftentimes we do this and it's 400 and some crazy years. And then we go through this exercise and then we find, okay, now we've gotten it down to 30 years. Huge, huge change. Just from the existing business, we went from never gonna happen 400 years, impossible to 30 years, okay? Still not ideal because most of us have these like two-year goals or five-year goals. Like I want to fully fund my retirement, buy a house, retire my spouse, you know, all these things back here that we're trying to do in like the next year or two years. But we've never actually gone through and put a dollar value to it or seen or calculated the timeline. And so we're going, we want to do it a year or two years. Okay. Well, now that we've optimized it, we've done all of this and we've cut it down to 30 years. Now the question is how much do we actually need to grow our business? So this is completely inverting the process, doing the opposite. Most of us are going, uh, I want to retire. I have all these goals. I'm going to get to seven or eight figures. Well, why? Why do you need to get to seven or eight figures? Because reasons. Basically, internet says I should be doing this. Okay, well, let's reverse engineer. Let's rig the game to win. Let's work backwards. Let's figure out, let's optimize everything first, then let's figure out how much we actually need to, to grow the business. So uh, how are we doing on time, Nick? Can I, can I share some of the strategies? Do we have enough time? Yeah, you're good. We're here okay. for, for the people that showed up. Okay, cool. So uh, let's just talk about a couple of just quick opportunities. Uh, one around the kind of reducing variable costs or reducing our costs. Uh, I call it the two Oreo principle. 
And basically the backstory and the two Oreo principle is that I gained 10 pounds last year and I was trying to figure out why. And then I realized that I found my wife's snack cabinet when we moved and I was essentially eating the equivalent of two Oreos a day. Uh, and that when you run the numbers on two Oreos a day, single stuffed is like 10 pounds that you gain. Nobody's doing single stuff. We're all doing double stuffed. <clears throat> so that's like 13 pounds. And so the point of that is that something seemingly small, two Oreos a day actually adds up to a, to a big uh, number over the course of the year. <clears throat> and so within our business, we have all these little Oreos that hit our account that we just ignore because it's only $50 or $80 or $100. And so <clears throat> what I do quarterly uh, and tell clients to do at least uh, annual, but ideally quarterly, <clears throat> is I just freeze my, I put a hold on my card. I don't, I'm not closing my accounts. I got a Capital One credit card. I can just go into the website and I can click hold. <clears throat> uh, you can also just uh, get your card reissued so you get a new account number. Uh, you're not, again, you're not closing the card because that's going to impact your credit. But by canceling your card or putting a hold on it, now you start getting all these alerts of all of the things that you forgot about. Like today, I just got a annual renewal notice for Mentor, mentor Box, uh, which is something I signed up for last year. And don't, I'm not using it at all. It's like a daily email and I don't know <clears throat> what else I, I got uh, from it. But if I hadn't canceled my card or put a whole uh, stop on my card, these annual charges would have, would have hit for something I'm no longer using. So by, by doing this, basically you get all these notifications and then you choose to opt back, opt back in or not. Typically from clients, I find uh, several thousand to five figures in annual costs. I did it with somebody else who has saved them $3,000 a month just from like canceling their card and just stuff annual, quarterly, monthly charges that they forgot about that we're just racking up. Now what you do there, it's a version of Nick's barbell. So we got on one end strategy and on the other end, we've got uh, boring stuff. <laughs> and so every time I find extra money, I just move it over to the boring. So the boring in this case might be a savings account, some sort of retirement account, back to my profit priority stuff, whatever I'm the highest priority for me. I just, okay, I just found $3,000 a month. I'm not going to spend that money, Parkinson's law. If it just hits my account, I'm probably going to spend it. <clears throat> now I've set up something to move it somewhere else. And you can do some really fun with numbers type things uh, where <clears throat> you look at what if I invested this and I just got a standard boring S&P average rate of return, 9.8%. Uh, and if I just put $10,000 into it once a year, the savings, once a, once a year for 10 years, it's like 130 grand. And then it just continues to grow. And after 30 years, it's <clears throat> something like uh, close to 2 million. If you get that number up to 50 grand, then you start getting into the pretty massive numbers. So 50 grand set aside, getting boring 9.8% over 40 years is something like 24 million. This is just boring stuff that we automate that we forget about, right? And so we find the savings, we allocate it towards our priorities, we try to get a decent rate of return, but we just need to sweep it over there. Otherwise, if we keep it into our current accounts, it's gonna get spent. And so we keep moving this extra money that we're finding to, to funding our priorities and that keeps compounding. So we do the strategy, we move it over. So we do the two Oreo principle thing, we move it over, that just compounds and becomes generational wealth. It's not home run money. Home run money is growing the enterprise value of your business. <clears throat> That's home run money. Keep doing that, uh, but we got to run the other race too. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm getting over a cold here. My voice is. So do Oreo principle. We all have thousands of dollars that we could probably recapture. <clears throat> under the tax, <clears throat> under the tax tips here. Let's just bust through a couple of them. Uh, <clears throat> so a couple of tax tips. <clears throat> uh, one, the Augusta loophole, low hanging fruit for everybody. Uh, 
the Augusta loophole basically says that you can rent your home out up to 14 days per year, completely tax free. <clears throat> so what that means is that, <clears throat> excuse me, what that means is that your business can actually rent your home from you up to 14 days a year for various meetings that you might have, board meetings, things like that. And so the business pays you rent and because it's for 14 days or less, uh, you don't have to report any of that income. The amount of rent that you can pay yourself is what would it cost you to rent a local conference room in your area? And if you've ever looked at renting a conference room from a major hotel, it's not cheap for a day. It's like two to five grand and up. So doing some quick math here, say that it's two grand a year, you do it 14 times per year, that's 28,000 that you can take out completely tax free from your business. That's going to save you income tax, might even save you payroll taxes. And so that's a significant amount. If you're in major cities like Seattle, LA, New York, Chicago, I mean, the cost of a local conference room is more like four or 5,000. Uh, you know, 5,000 times 14, 14 days, that's $70,000 tax free that you can take out of your business significant, significant savings. And the reality is, is you're already doing stuff at your house to begin with, having meetings, offsites for yourself, approving your salary, things like that. So get the Augusta loophole going. Um, also, uh, most people have heard of uh, home office. Most people aren't doing it because they've also read all these articles about how it's one of the top five audit flags. And so there's a simple step that you can do. Maybe 1% of businesses have this uh, in place that I've seen. It's called an accountable plan. It's really a policy that you enact that controls how you reimburse yourself for certain expenses. And we want to declare our home as an administrative home office. That means any travel we do from our home for business is deductible. If we drive to an offsite, we drive to the airport, take a Uber anywhere, uh, we're moving from one office to another office. All of that is deductible, plus a portion of our uh, operating expenses of our home. And so because we've enacted this thing called an accountable plan, a policy, that allows us to reimburse ourselves for these uh, personal, otherwise personal expenses. So this typically adds up to uh, anywhere from 10 to 20,000 in additional uh, missed deductions. So now we've got, you know, the the one to 3,000 potentially a month in savings from this two Oreo principle thing. We've got this Augusta loophole, that's 30 to 70,000 we can take out tax-free. Here's another 10 to 20,000 and probably missed expenses from this accountable plan and administrative home office. Those are just quick wins. These are just things you're already doing that are, that are easy. These aren't advanced strategies, but we'd like to go through this list of about uh, 10 to 15 quick wins like the Augusta loophole, things like that. Pick all of those off. That's real money. That probably can fund a lot of your uh, priorities already. Or certainly cut the time horizon down uh, significantly. Then we get into the more advanced strategies that are out there. Uh, things like a, a mega Roth, solo 401ks, uh, becoming a real estate professional, which is a tax uh, designation that's a way to effectively eliminate all of your, your uh, taxable income through uh, acquiring additional properties. Those are more uh, advanced strategies, but if you're already leaving low-hanging fruit of tens of thousands to, to potentially 100,000 plus, capture that really quickly before you move into those, those uh, more advanced strategies. So that's what we do with the, with the profit priority uh, and that methodology, I wanted to give you guys some some low hanging fruit. Nick, any uh, any questions on those? No, I think that's uh, it's pretty straightforward. It's things that, like you said, it, the, the example you gave is fifty thousand dollars a year put into a pretty basic uh, investment is twenty four million after forty years. And I think back of hand, um, I, I think people. I just want to point out. I think anybody listening might might think like fifty thousand dollars a year is is a lot to find. Uh, but I see the names on here. Um, a lot of people are probably pretty close to having that in their recurring expenses, the, just through the Oreo principle and the, the Augusta loophole and all that. So um, I've seen you do back of hand math with my stuff alone, you know, and, and we don't realize how much is quote unquote slipping through the cracks and just uh, super actionable and, and uh, practical stuff. But uh, I just want to, 
for people listening, um, don't don't assume that whatever numbers you're working with are because this happens sometimes are too small, right? Too small to find these wins. Because uh, I mean they're they're there, and it's just good habit to get into anyway. Yeah, just to just to plus that the fifty nine. We don't worry about the fifty nine dollars here or there, but the challenge because the but the challenge then becomes that we have like a hundred of those $59 things that happen over the course of the year, right? Because we sign up once and then they get us in the automated billing and then we just forget about it. And then it hits our account and we go, oh crap. Well, now it's too late. And it just, it adds up just, that's why I call it the two Oreo principle, right? Two Oreos in the scheme of life, not that big of a deal. That's the $59 equivalent. The problem is two Oreos constantly that adds up to the 10 pounds, 10 to 13 pounds. So there is, there's real money there. I've done it for low six figure businesses. I've done it for eight figure businesses. There's always a bunch of money that's, that's just there to be captured that we can then reallocate. And that's what it's really about. It's awesome. Just continually reall reallocating and recalibrating. So, you know, in this, in this presentation, <laughs> we made a kind of a huge assumption and that is that you're, you're looking to, uh, to grow your business and uh, for a reason and not just simply to, to have one and to say you got to seven figures or eight figures. And so at the end of the day, if you're not really crystal clear on your profit priorities, you haven't built in these algorithms, these dynamic algorithms to help you make the right financial decisions, then you're gonna be subject to all these biases and you're gonna wake up, what's the point basically? You're gonna wake up every year like most clients do, or maybe uh, every six months and go, hey, I really should get on that priority of retiring my spouse. You know what? The solution to that, I just need to grow my business more. And then you get back to focusing on growing your business, but that isn't necessarily the, the fastest path to achieving that goal. There's already money sitting there uh, for you to capture, and it just needs to be bucketed in the right way. Awesome. So, do you have more? Is that your last slide? I think that's it. Yeah. What's the point? Awesome. So we, we've been jamming a little bit about um, how, how, how necessary this is and how, how simple some of it is and, and how it's the, the concept of, of being preference-based. A lot of people, it drives people nuts because my whole thing is it depends. Um, and, you know, people just want like the – the true or false, the yes or no, the good and the bad. Yeah. Um, and so you uh, you brought up the uh, the the concept, the the thing that you're thinking about rolling out. And if you're watching, you're the first people to hear about this. Uh, if it gets rolled out, it doesn't get rolled out until next week officially. I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. <sighs> That's right. Yep. Yeah, so we're rolling it out officially next week. But yeah, this is literally the first folks that we're going to tell about this. So you you just just because uh, you know we 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 love Dan, we're closely with him. Um, the thinking about he's been thinking about doing this offer, which is a very very strong um, one of those things, kind of like hey, um, gonna way over deliver, and uh, because we feel like people need it, uh, and it's it's the profit takeover, right, or the financial takeover, or do we dis decide on the yep. name? 30 day yeah 30 day profit takeover cool and so walk us through what that looks like uh how can we get involved if, if you're interested in, right. in getting dan's help and his team's help with uh with all this stuff and really getting it personalized understanding what it means for you um tell us what that looks like yeah so basically back to this slide over here in the first uh in the 30 days that we work with with uh you doing this 30 day profit takeover we're doing what's in this box in this box right here, which is evaluating your your positioning, and so really defining what your core capital numbers are for you personally and your business, and building out those dynamic algorithms. So is it one month? Is it three months? Is it six months of salary? What are the numbers there? Uh, how much in operating expense should we be setting aside? What are our rules for investment? We're really codifying that, getting those accounts set up because we quite literally are going to separate that money uh, within your financials into separate accounts so that you aren't subject to that bias. 
then we're mapping out the priorities that you have, figuring out those dollar values. And again, folks don't like to do this on their own uh, because it's defining success and defining failure. So anytime I've given out the worksheets uh, in, uh, with done for you clients and in trainings and all that, it always just comes back to like, can you just help me with this? Because I'm really, it's kind of terrifying. So we're gonna map out all those priorities, dollar values, look at your current available cash flow, see how much, uh, see what the timeline is to, uh, to actually fund your goals. And then we're gonna do the optimization. So I gave a few of the strategies today around the two Oreo principle and a guest loop and things like that. But what are, the, what are the wins that we can just pick off right now during this 30 day period? Let's get those implemented. Let's see how, how much uh, faster that uh, cuts down funding your priorities. And uh, all the worksheets, templates, all that stuff to actually uh, implement our recommendations. We're going to do that all in 30 days. Now, the intention uh, is to have folks then engage us uh, ongoing in the calibration, which is folks who are working with us on an ongoing basis, uh, where we're kind of helping you run all this stuff. That's not a requirement, just being transparent that we're doing this because we want to get people into our, our ongoing but we got to do all this first for you to be successful in the ongoing calibration. Awesome. What is the, uh, for people listening uh, live, uh, this replay is going to come down on the group, but it'll be available elsewhere. Um, what's the investment look like? How, what steps do we need to take if we're listening to this right now to, uh, to take you up on this offer? Yeah. So normal cost uh, to do this, what we call a roadmap, charge 4,800 is our starting cost and we go up from there. But I think you and I agree that for your audience for this 997. Cool. So what I would do is um, I'm going to, if you're watching this live on the Facebook group, reach out to Dan, drop a comment, make sure that you, you know, the steps, I'll, I'll make sure that you know the steps. Dan will make sure that you know the steps to enroll. <laughs> um, if you are, on the Zoom, what we're going to do is we're going to end the uh, the share in Facebook and jam for a little bit privately here in Zoom because you showed up to Zoom and I like when people show up to Zoom and register and, and participate. So uh, 997, ridiculous deal because I, I know people pay 4800 uh, for the roadmap. Appreciate you bringing this to uh, my audience because it's it's the thing that I'm, I'm most adamant about is like, What's the point? What, what are we doing this for? Uh, so anybody interested, uh, I'm also going to throw up a page. It will be live in about 10 seconds. That is uh, ProfitTakeover.com. ProfitTakeover.com. You can opt in. It'll have uh, uh, some information and a way to contact Dan. And uh, if you're in the Facebook group, we're about to stop the share. We're going to talk to Zoom, people in the Zoom only.